Well, welcome to the Baker Institute um, for the next in our uh, 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 series of lectures uh, sponsored by Shell, a very generous donation that, that sponsors the Shell Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, we're actually very pleased to be able to welcome Fatih Bural, the chief economist from the IEA here. Um, and uh, I just have to comment, uh, the delay is really related to what ultimately amounts to a, a common Houston theme now, traffic. Um, uh, actually, Greg Gidry, who's going to do the introduction of Fatih here in just a minute, um, he's a, an executive vice president for Shell Upstream America's un Unconventionals, but uh, he was a little bit late because uh, I guess he said it took him about an hour and a half to get here from, from the, the campus over off Derry Ashford, and I said, well, you know, I was thinking I can understand that because I actually live out that way, and there are days when I leave and it takes me an hour, an hour and a half to get home, and I wonder why I live out there, but um, having said that, I'm going to go ahead and hand the floor over to Greg so we can get started. Greg. Thank you, thank you, Ken. And uh, I'm sure we'll have a few more stragglers come in. It was uh, it was quite a quite a battle getting over here, but uh, no, sorry for the delay. Um, I just uh, good evening to everyone, and and uh, just welcome everyone to the Shell Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, this is the the flagship speaker program of the the Baker Institute. Um, you know, it, it reflects the vision of U.S. Secretary James Baker. Uh, and, and his commitment to defining the role of statesmanship, integrity, and bold leadership in meeting the challenges of the 21st century. And certainly energy is, is very central to, to one of those challenges and, and what we'll talk about tonight. We thank the Houston community for supporting this partnership. Uh, over the past 18 years, it seems like yesterday when, when uh, the center was, was open, I look forward to many more dynamic years with this globally recognized and, and respected institute. Um, our guest tonight, Dr. Fatih Barol, uh, Chief Economist and Director of Global Energy Economics at the Inter International Energy Agency in Paris. And uh, he just made the trip, just made it, made it here this afternoon. Dr. Barol is, a, is responsible for the IEA's flagship World Energy Outlook. Uh, it's recognized as the most authoritative source of strategic analysis of global energy markets. Um, he, he will discuss the latest thinking, some of the latest thinking tonight. He's also the founder and chair of the IEA Energy Business Council, which provides a forum to enhance cooperation between the energy industry and energy, energy policy makers. Dr. Barol certainly fits the bill as a distinguished lecturer. Uh, while I'm a big fan of his work, I've actually, this is the first time I get to meet him, I was really looking forward to that. Uh, in researching his background and accomplishments, it's quite an impressive list, and um, you'll, you'll have to be patient with me for a minute because it, it takes some time to list it. Uh, first of all, named as the Forbes magazine, named by Forbes magazine, among the most powerful people of influence on the world's energy scene. He's a member of the UN Secretary General's High Level Group on Sustainable Energy for All. He's chairman of the World Energy Forum's Davos Energy Advisory Board. Additionally, some of the awards that he's been offered, uh, been awarded. In January 2014, just very, very recently, the Japanese Emperor's Order of the Rising Sun, the country's highest honor the Officer of, um, of the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic in 2012, that country's highest honor. In 2009, alongside awards from the Dutch and Polish governments, Dr. Barol received Germany's Federal Cross of Merit, which is that country's most prestigious uh, decoration. He was awarded the Gold Honor Medal of Austria in 2007. And I'll try this one, and I've actually got a bit of French in my background, but uh, this one, this one is, uh, is good. He, he was made a Chevalier uh, dans l'ordre de Palme Académique by France in 2006. And hopefully I didn't butcher that too bad. This impressive list follows awards from the governments of Turkey in 2005 and the United States in 2004 and the Russian Academy of Sciences in 2000, uh, 2002. I told you it would take me a while. He is the past winner of the International Association of Energy Economists 
annual award for outstanding contribution to the profession. On a more, post, on a more personal note, Fatih is an honorary life member of the Galatasaray Football Club, okay? To a South Louisianian like me, that would be a, an honor akin to being made president of the New Orleans, New Orleans Saints. <laughs> or better than that, president of the New Orleans Saints fan club, the Houdat Nation. Okay. <laughs> Prior to joining IEA in 1995, uh, Dr. Barol worked at uh, OPEC in Vienna, which of course brings him much closer to the business that we do. A Turkish citizen, Dr. Barol was born in Ankara in 1958. He earned his BS in uh, power engineering from the Technical University in Istanbul. And he received his master's and PhD in energy economics from the Technical University in Vienna. So without any further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Perol. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much to uh, Rice University and to Shell for uh, inviting me to this uh, very prestigious uh, meeting and giving me the opportunity to share with you uh, our ideas about the global energy developments. Rice University, the work it is being carried out here, we follow very closely since many, many years, doing a very good job here, and uh, we learn from you a lot, I should tell you. Thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, with Shell, a company that I work since several years uh, together. I have several uh, colleagues from Shell who is working in my office. I think Peter Wood is here, Peter, and uh, uh, many others. Uh, we learn from them. And the, uh, the work that Sh Shell does in many areas of the world gives a lot of inspiration for our work, and I hope our work also contributes to the uh, thinking uh, as well. Now today, I will uh, talk with you, uh, not only on oil, but a global energy picture, recent developments, a bit of the uh, long-term view, and their implications, both on the side of economy and a bit on the geopolitics, which I thought Mr. Ambassador could also uh, enjoy uh, 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 to hear. Before looking at the Looking at the uh, future, I thought, let's first look at uh, today, the point of uh, departure. Today, if we think the global energy picture, for example, like a theater uh, scene, what is happening is the roles of the actors in the theater piece is being rewritten. New roles are given. And this is mainly driven by three major developments, this change of the roles. One is the, of course, shale revolution, but also the change of the nuclear policy in many countries after Fukushima, number two, and number three, in some countries, we see the pricing of renewables and fossil fuels give some advantage or disadvantage to the penetration of these fuels. So three things. One, the issue of the shale. Second, the post-Fukushima nuclear. And third, specific pricing policies of uh, energy. And this gives a new role, new uh, a, a, a identity to the players. What do I mean with that? First of all, some countries we knew in this, uh, the energy theater scene as energy importers are turning to be, in your role, energy exporters, such as, of course, the United States, but also Brazil, 
Brazil is very soon, we believe, will be a net oil exporter, completely new. Some countries whom we knew in the global energy picture, their role being energy exporters, energy producers, such as the Middle East countries, their domestic demand, their energy use is growing so strongly that they are affecting the global energy markets as a consumer as well. When you look at the last four or five years, the Middle East oil consumption growth was only second to China. And this will continue not only in oil, but in other uh, uh, fuel types. So therefore, the role of the Middle East is not only being an exporter, but also a consumer. They are coming very strongly. Third, trade patterns. Now, some countries, for example, Canada, some exporters, they have to look for new trade patterns. Until recently, the life for Canadians, I, I think, I am sure we have many Canadians uh, colleagues here, were very easy. Producing oil and gas, sending to south, get the cash, enjoy the life, more or less, very uh, summarized. And now, South may not need in the future so much of uh, Canadian energy. Therefore, Canada is making a huge turn to Asia now. Just look at the, uh, not only the energy companies, but look at the, how many visits the Canadian government officials are paying to Asian countries in the last uh, 24 months. Just a small uh, look. The same thing is in Europe and Russia. Russia has uh, one major, very loyal uh, client, which is Europe. But now, with the fact that a new producers coming in the uh, picture, Europe is trying to find a new source of uh, oil and gas and therefore, Russia is also turning very, very quickly to Asia, to Japan, to China, and others. So, why I am saying this is that not only the roles are changing, the exporters versus importers, exporters, consumers, but the trade patterns are changing, and we are going to see a new energy theater with the roles changing, and the countries and companies who are able to read this change will definitely position themselves uh, in an advantageous position. So these are the changes happening, and there are certain things which are not changing and which I personally would like to see changing. What are those? First of all, carbon dioxide emissions are continuing to increase and putting the world on an unsustainable trend. More than two-thirds of the emissions leading to climate change come from the energy sector. And energy sector plays a role here, and therefore this is a trend that I feel it needs to be changed. Second, in many countries in the world, especially in emerging world, consumption of fossil fuels are heavily subsidized, mainly in Middle East, but in Asia and other countries as well. What does it mean? This means the, the, in, the, uh, the, in the pump station, the gasoline diesel are very, very cheap, much cheaper than their economic value, which gives a wasteful use of uh, consumption, which gives a lead to wasteful use of consumption. And this is definitely not good for those countries' economies and also uh, the efficiency of energy use. 
Another thing which doesn't change, and I wish it was changing, is the very fact, very far from Houston, but today, 1.3 billion people, about 20% of global population, they have no electricity. Mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. So these, these areas. And not having in electricity is a major issue. It's not a trivial uh, story. Very simple. The parents cannot keep the medication for their children in the refrigerator. Simple, but very important. You don't have a, a connection with the rest of the world. And with the current policies, we think in the next 20 years, there will be still more than 1 billion people who will have no access to electricity, which is, I think, a major issue. Final look at the current situations and the prices. First of all, in terms of oil prices, almost three years we are seeing oil prices averaging a brand about $100, which has never been the case in the past. And now many people think, and it is the case, $100 is a, uh, is a, a normal price, and this is the price that uh, we may well see in the next years to come. I personally would be very surprised, unlike some of my colleagues, to see the oil prices drop significantly uh, in the next years, unless we don't see a major economic uh, uh, downturn in certain parts of the world. And about prices, there is a growing divergence in the natural gas and electricity prices in different countries of the world. And this is leading to major issues uh, in terms of the competitiveness of the countries, and also uh, it will have major geopolitical implications as well. The gas and electricity prices in different countries being so different from each other. And I will come to that in a minute. Now, looking at the future a bit, first of all, where does the energy demand growth come from? It doesn't come from the countries, the growth, that the countries that are the members of the International Energy Agency that I represent. Our members, US, Canada, European countries, Japan, their contribution to global energy demand growth is almost negligible. It's not growing. The growth is coming mainly from Asia. Now, several years ago, perhaps about uh, nine years ago, we have, like many other colleagues, successfully forecasted the role of China in these years. And now, what we are saying is, around 2020s, India may well take over the role of China of today for a few reasons. What will happen in China and what will happen in India? China is pushing a major, putting a lot of effort on efficiency. One. Second, China is trying to so-called rebalancing the economy, going from the heavy industries to light industries. And uh, also, Chinese population growth is slowing down significantly. Whereas in India, there are very strong dynamics, which tells us that the India may well be uh, around 2020s an engine of the global energy demand uh, growth. And Middle East countries. Middle East countries today, they consume about 6.6 uh, million barrels per day of uh, oil. And we think in about uh, less than 20 years of time, 
their consumption will become about 10 million barrels per day, which is equal to the consumption of China of today. So Middle East will consume soon oil as much as China consumes today. So becoming, a, again, a major consumer of oil. Or electricity. Amount of power plants, fleet, Middle East will add in the next 20 years is equal to today's Japan plus Korea. So Middle East countries will beat one Japan, one Korea in the next 20 years, plus transmission and distribution lines and everything, a major move uh, there as well. And so does the uh, uh, Africa and other countries contribute. In terms of fuels, which fuels are going to uh, take how much share? Now, before looking at the future, let me tell you something, a number from the past, which I find interesting. <clears throat> Some of you may remember, I, I know we have many colleagues uh, from the uh, uh, diplomats here from different uh, uh, countries, especially Europeans would remember. In 1987, there was a Norwegian Prime Minister, Madame Brutland, who made a report at the request of the uh, Secretary General at that time, which called sustainable development, which concept came for the first time. And it was a kickoff of a major effort, global effort, to reduce the share of fossil fuels and to give a boost to uh, uh, other fuels. And 1987, this effort has started, and many countries in the world tried to reduce the share of fossil fuels, pushing uh, wind, solar, other renewables, and, 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 and the others. And when that effort has started worldwide, 1987, share of fossil fuels in the global energy mix was 82%. And today, after 25 years of efforts of many, many governments in the world, share of fossil fuels in the global energy mix is 82%. No change whatsoever. This tells us something, or at least two things. <clears throat> One, economic facts are very stubborn. And they may be, well, be more powerful than the policy targets. Second, perhaps if those efforts of all these governments were not there, we might have seen even higher share of fossil fuels today in the global energy mix. And when we look at the future, we think that the global energy mix will be still heavily dominated by fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas. A huge growth coming from gas, equal to the growth coming from uh, oil and uh, coal put together. But the renewables are going to grow significantly as well. And this is mainly as a result of government policies. Many governments today in the world, including the United States, European countries, and the others, providing significant amount of subsidies for renewables for them to see a market share. If those subsidies are reduced, which is not uh, impossible, because there are discussions in Europe, in many countries, to reduce those subsidies, we may well see this green part of the renewables, this bar, to be smaller in the future. Now, one of the implications of increasing uh, fossil fuels is on the uh, carbon dioxide emissions. We see that the carbon dioxide emissions are continuing to grow, and this is a serious issue for climate change. The world is perfectly on track of a temperature increase 
which is above the accepted levels by the scientists. And next year, there will be an important uh, rendezvous in Paris, bringing the uh, all world leaders together, trying to have an agreement on the climate change. There was a failure in Copenhagen in 2009, and this time all the world leaders will come to Paris to discuss if they can have an agreement here. And to be honest with you, I am not very or completely pessimistic. Because the US emission numbers, the second largest emitter, is much better than 2009. China has its reasons now to put policies in place to clean up their energy system. And US and China are working very closely together in terms of climate change. And Europe continues to push the climate change agenda. So therefore, I wouldn't be surprised if there were some positive news coming from there. Now, I wanted to bring to your attention, there are many colleagues from, again, from the diplomats here, since the negotiations will take place very soon, or even if you watch the news, to understand a bit the background of this uh, story. Where does the problem come from? Now, all the countries in the world, almost all the countries in the world now agree that the climate change is a problem, and we have to solve this. There is no problem on this point. The issue is, who is responsible of this mess? Therefore, who is going to take how much responsibility in the future? This is the burden sharing. This is the problem. Now, China, for example, and many other developing countries say, you, United States, or Europeans, don't look at the emissions of today and the future emissions only, but you have to look at the historical emissions because during your industrial revolution, you use a lot of coal and put it in the atmosphere and they are still there, the concentration. Therefore, you have to look at a historical perspective. Therefore, we shouldn't be blamed developing countries alone for this problem. This was the argument of the many developing countries. But this argument, ladies and gentlemen, is not anymore holding for the following reason. When even if you look at the 100 years of a perspective, because of the very strong growth coming from the, uh, the uh, non-OECD, or in other terms, the developing countries, the share will be even in the historical perspective, it is 50-50. The responsibilities are becoming more or less equal between the developed world versus developing world. No more argument there. Second, China says, you cannot look at the emissions only, how many gigatons, how many megatons of CO2. You have to look at it on a per capita basis. I am 1.3 billion people, and you are only 200, 300 million people. You can't compare like that. You have to look at a per capita basis, how many tons of CO2 one person emits, so divided emissions by the number of people. And to be honest with you, I believe they have a point in that. However, again, looking at the numbers, next year, China, even on a per capita basis, Chinese emissions are overtaking that of Europe, and very soon they are taking uh, uh, over the all OECD countries, all developed countries as well. And this argument will not hold as well uh, uh, very, very soon. So therefore, I expect that there, is, there are many reasons why we may well see an uh, agreement in Paris with the help of able French diplomats. Now let me come to the oil markets. <clears throat> First, let me start with demand. We, of course, believe that the demand will continue to increase while we expect some decline in the OECD countries, the oil demand. We see 
a strong growth coming from uh, China, India, and Middle East. And this is definitely, this is, these are the uh, drivers. And in terms, of the, in terms of the sectors, I think it is important to note that transportation, both uh, the private cars, but also freight, and at the same time, petrochemicals are going to play a critical role. Just to give you one number, which I find uh, uh, important, <clears throat> about one third of the growth in global oil demand will come from Asian trucks only, just to put it in its context. Why it is important? It is important because when we look at the, what type of uh, oil products are needed, we see a big growth of the need of diesel vis-a-vis -vis gasoline and uh, others. And this is definitely an important signal for the oil companies and for the uh, refineries. Talking about the refineries, we think refineries, especially in US or Europe and US, there are significant challenges coming. And there are three reasons for these challenges. First, more and more oil will escape refineries. They will go directly to the consumers. Especially the growing NGL means they don't want refineries, they go directly to the petrochemicals or LPG used there. And biofuels is the same. So some of the oil will directly buy, uh, go to the consumers without uh, going through the refineries. This is one issue. Second, today, worldwide, mostly in the OECD uh, countries in Europe and US, we think there are about 16 million barrels per day uh, spare and idle capacity. This is the second uh, problem. And the third problem is that there will be significant amount of new refinery capacity being built in China and India, mainly for the domestic markets, and Middle East for domestic markets also, but also for the exports. So therefore, we think there will be a substantial amount of we think about 10 million barrels per day of capacity of refineries in uh, Europe and uh, US uh, facing serious challenges in the next years to come as a result of these three major developments. And now a bit on the supply. Some of you may remember Two years ago, in the World Energy Outlook, we came up with a major finding. We said, United States will overtake Saudi Arabia as the largest oil producer of the world in the year 2017. And this was a, a, a finding of our work. And this year's uh, 2013 World Energy Outlook does confirm this trend, and we think it will be even even a bit earlier, perhaps 2015, US will be the largest oil producer of the world in terms of oil overtaking Saudi Arabia. But this our finding sometimes misinterpreted or misunderstood, unfortunately. First of all, let me tell you something. It's something very simple, but I want to underline. To be the largest oil producer is something. To be a largest oil exporter is something different. There are two different stories. You can be the largest producer, but you don't necessarily need to be a largest oil exporter if you consume a lot of this oil uh, at home. And as a result of these changes, uh, these findings, our finding, other colleagues' finding, many people thought that 
the, in fact, the importance of Middle East in the global oil markets is diminishing. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, completely wrong. Politically and analytically, completely wrong. And this message, if, if we continue to give this message, this may well have unintended consequences for the global oil markets. Let me try to elaborate a bit on that. When we look at the next 10 years or so, we see, of course, a growth, significant growth coming from the uh, United States, shale oil, up to 4 million barrels per day increase, very nice, which is a very good news for the United States and for the rest of the world, and puts the United States on track of not need to import oil from Middle East, or perhaps not need to import any oil at all. It's a very good news. But we think around 2020s, the, uh, the shale oil production will uh, increase and come to a plateau and more or less stay there, and we will see increase from other parts of the world as well. However, after 2020s, we expect the, the, this growth will uh, slow down, and in order to meet the growth in the global oil demand, we need to see a significant increase from Middle East countries. Yes, shale oil is going to meet almost all, perhaps even higher, uh, the US uh, consumption. But there is a world beyond the United States when it comes to the global oil demand. Asian oil demand growth is uh, increasing substantially, and there is one major address to meet that growth, which is Middle East. We shouldn't think, at least we don't think so, that the U.S. oil will meet the growth in uh, Middle East, uh, uh, in the uh, Asian uh, oil demand. Asian oil demand will be met by Middle East uh, uh, countries, and of course, other countries as well, Canada, Brazil, Russia, and others, but the big address is Middle East. Why I am underlining this? If we keep on giving the wrong signal that the Middle East oil may not be needed as much as we thought before, investments may not flow in in the Middle East uh, fields, and we may well uh, see a slowing down of the investments, and when we need Middle East oil growth around 2020s, uh, we may well have challenges to see oil to flow, new oil to come from Middle East countries. Therefore, my uh, very humble uh, suggestion is we have to be careful when we interpret the results of the shale oil revolution in the United States. Definitely good news for the United States, congratulations, etc. but don't go over the board. <laughs> and there is a world beyond the United States which would need oil at at least reasonable prices, and therefore uh, we have to uh, understand that aspect as well. Now, Brazil, every year we focus on a, a country in depth, and this year we work on Brazil. We think Brazilian uh, uh, deep water will grow uh, significantly, even though our projections are uh, much l l more modest than the uh, official uh, estimates. We think uh, deep water in 10 years of time can reach around uh, 4 million barrels per day. And uh, Brazil, around 2015, uh, will experience a major change, namely going to be a significant oil exporter. This success story, and this is a success story as well, that it has two legs. One is the production growth, definitely we all know that. But second, Brazil, since years Brazilian governments push the sustainable biofuels production 
and therefore a substituted domestic oil product consumption pushed the demand, domestic demand down. So pushing the demand down, pushing the production up means 2015 Brazil uh, will be a, a, an a exporting country and uh, very soon will be one of the top six oil producers of the world following US, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Canada, and Iraq. So therefore, Brazil is coming to the, as we say, in the Champions League, and this is a very important development there. But, but uh, this Brazil needs significant amount of uh, investments, and uh, these investments, about $60 billion per year, May well uh, may have difficulties to raise those investments as there are certain conditions in uh, Brazilian uh, oil uh, sector, uh, such as the local content, which may well put some tensions throughout the supply chain, which may end up end up with uh, delaying the some of the projects. Now. Electricity-wise, Brazil is one of the cleanest countries in the world, mainly as a result of uh, lots of uh, hydropower and other uh, uh, renewables compared to the world. Uh, the very fortunate way of having a lot of hydropower provides Brazil with rather clean energy sources. Now, in terms of investments for the upstream, there is one issue that I want to underline. I said a lot of oil need to come from Middle East, but a lot of money has to be put in North America because of the cost of production. We think the, uh, about globally, we need about, uh, in the next 20 years, 15 trillion US dollar of investment for oil and gas upstream, and 30% is in uh, North America. Only in the United States, in the next 20 years, four trillion US dollar of investment is needed in order to see this gas production going from about 700 BCM today to 800 BCM, and also in terms of the uh, oil to see to make this shale gas uh, revolution continue and happen. And this is definitely something that we all need to take into account. One issue here I wanted to share with you. <clears throat> Worldwide, we are going to find 15 million barrels per day. And today, our consumption or production, whatever you call it, is about 90 uh, million barrels per day. And we will go to about uh, just a bit over 100 million barrels per day, 10 million barrels per day, or 12 in the next uh, 20 uh, years or so. But this money, these investments, are not only needed in order to meet the growth in the demand. They are mostly needed in order to bring new fields in the picture to compensate the fields which are declining. So when we think of the new production needed, new oil needed, we think this is needed for the new demand growth, to meet the demand growth. No, this is only a very small part of the story. The main part of the story is the, there are several fields which are in decline, and we have to inject money to those fields, plus we have to find new fields to compensate those fields which are in decline. In summary, if we have to invest $3 in the next 20 years in the oil upstream, $2 are needed in order to, comp in order to compensate the fields which are in decline, and $1 is needed in order to meet the growth of the demand. So this decline issue is a very important issue that we have to take into account when we think of the future oil markets. Now, one issue on the renewables and China. Renewable energies are uh, pushed by all the governments in the world. 
as I said in the beginning, by Europe, US, and Japan, as well as other countries in, in Asia. But the country where we see the biggest growth of renewable energies is China. The growth of renewable energies in China is bigger than US plus all European countries plus Japan put together. A huge, huge, huge push in China. And this is not only as we may think of solar and wind, but this is mainly coming from hydropower, in, especially in China and emerging countries. Once again, renewables are growing strongly, but except for hydropower, wind and solar have major difficulties to compete with the fossil fuels in the absence of generous government subsidies. If those subsidies were not in place, renewables will not be able to compete with the fossil fuels. So, and I can tell you that in Europe, many countries, Germany, even Germany, Spain, Italy, they are cutting renewable subsidies because governments are already in big difficulties and to put a subsidy, that is a major problem and renewable subsidies also give a boost to increase of electricity prices in many countries. So this brings me to the, my last issue before we go uh, on the uh, uh, questions. <clears throat> the, we were just discussing with uh, Mr. Ambassador a few minutes ago. The shale revolution and the other uh, issues I mentioned to you, post Fukushima nuclear policies and the others, they ended up with two major consequences. One, it has major consequences on the geopolitics of energy, which is changing very rapidly throughout the world. Sometimes in the right way, sometimes in the wrong way, but changing very, very rapidly. And second, it is also redefining the economic competitiveness of the countries vis-a-vis -vis each other, especially when it comes to the energy-intensive industries. And I will explain you uh, how. Before the shale gas uh, revolution, natural gas prices between the countries and regions were more or less the same. It was, ratio was 1 to 1, 1 to 1.1, 1 to 0 0.9. They were more or less the same. But now today, when you look at the gas prices, natural gas prices, they are three times in Europe higher than in the United States, and they are five times higher in Asia, in Japan and Asia, than in the United States. I do not know any other commodity, such an important commodity, where you have such major price uh, differentials. This is a major issue. This is a very bad news for Europe and Japan, and I think this is a very good news for the United States. And this is important, but more important than this is, I believe, this is not a one-off issue, this is a structural issue. We believe this price differential may narrow down a bit, but will be with us for many years to come. For example, we think the European gas prices will be in the next 20 years at least two times more expensive than the US gas prices. Japanese three times more expensive than the US gas prices. And this is a huge, huge, huge implications. And not only that, in terms of the electricity prices, we also see a similar trend as electricity prices, mainly as a result of the first natural gas as an input to electricity generation being expensive. 
if the input is expensive, then the price is expensive. Second, some European countries said goodbye to nuclear power, up and running nuclear power plants, and replaced them by uh, other energy sources. And I mentioned the renewable subsidies also give a rise to electricity prices in uh, many countries. Now, as a result of that, I would say many years to come, both in the natural gas and electricity prices, there will be a substantial cost differential between the United States and the many of the United States uh, economic competitors. And this is a time that uh, will need to be, I believe, used by the United States and the others carefully, by the others, how, what can they do? by the United States, how can I make the most out of this window of opportunity, perhaps 20 years? You may think it's a long time, but it's not a long time. How, what can I do in the next 20 years to make the most out of this uh, uh, time frame? Now, one of the consequences we looked into in our uh, World Energy Outlook is on the energy intensive industries. All the industries use energy. But some industries, some subsectors of industry, use more energy than the others. We call them energy intensive industries. When you produce something, it can be a, I don't, it can be a glass, it can be a, it can be a, a, a television set, it can be a, an iron. There are three major cost components: cost of labor, cost of capital, and uh, uh, cost of energy. And the cost of energy in certain sectors are very, very substantial part of the total costs. And therefore, these sectors are very sensitive to the energy prices. What are those petrochemicals, aluminum, iron steel, pulp and paper, and others? And they provide a major part of uh, the economy. In Europe, about 30% of the economic output. In Japan, it is the same. And uh, also, they are a significant source of employment. And we looked these sectors in the future with this energy price gas and electricity being going in these directions, which country will be affected in these sectors, their market share, international trade, and are they going to be, who is going to be better off, who is going to be worse off in terms of iron steel, in terms of the uh, aluminum, petrochemicals, and so on. And when we look at it, the different countries, we see that the, there are winners, such as US and emerging countries, and the clear losers will be Europe and Japan. And this, I believe, this I believe can give a very strong boost to U.S. economy if the cards are played well. And as I, as we said in our book, it wouldn't be a surprise if we see around 2015 or 16 a very strong comeback of U.S. economy and uh, as a result of what is happening in the manufacturing industry, but also on the balance of trade. And definitely alarm bells are ringing for Europe and others. Before putting my thoughts together, let me uh, uh, explain one more issue. When I travel to Europe or Asia, and when we discuss about the gas price uh, station, many of them uh, ask the question, or we discuss, they say, these Americans, they have a lot of uh, gas, and if they were nice people, if they were kind enough with us, and if they were to export to Europe a lot of gas, 
we would then have like the oil, we would have one uh, gas price, and this problem we are facing, the competitiveness problem, wouldn't be such a life and death problem, which is, I can tell you today, it's a life and death problem. There is no one single speech of a European leader which doesn't uh, address the issue of competitiveness. From, from, uh, from Mrs. Merkel to, the, to Holland and uh, everybody, it's a big issue in, in Europe because a lot of uh, uh, European facilities are facing of closure. Now, they say if the Euro Americans are not doing it because of this and this and this conspiracy theories. So, what I tell them is, first of all, to see one single gas price, like the oil price, is impossible. It has nothing to do with the Americans being uh, 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 nice or not. They are definitely nice people, but this has nothing to do with the, with the gas issue. Why we cannot see one uh, gas price, or why we cannot see European gas prices coming to the level of the American gas price? For the following reason. Very simple. It's even arithmetics. We, have, we are going to in the US gas prices very unusual phases, but let's forget this. Let's assume it's about $4, the US gas prices. In, in Europe today, gas prices are about $11. Four versus 11. If you decide to export LNG to Europe, depending on whom you talk, the cost of liquefaction, shipping, gasification is between five or six dollars. So four dollars plus six dollars come to ten dollars and we have already $11 anyways in, in the Europe today, it may help, it will put a very important cap, definitely, it will be very helpful for Europe, but to think that you will have the gas as $4 like the United States is impossible. We may see some increase in the US, some decrease in Europe, but to have the same prices is impossible, therefore, Europe will remain many years to come so is uh, Asia, much higher, high gas cost region compared to the uh, United States. This is something that we need to uh, take into account. We have colleagues here in the oil industry who knows better than me, but to bring oil from a point A to point B, and the same calorific value of gas from point A to point B, oil is seven times cheaper than gas. In other words, gas is seven times more expensive than oil. So therefore, there is an issue of shipping uh, issue, gasification, liquefaction, and therefore we think uh, US gas, when exported, and will come, of course, to the markets, will provide more flexibility to the markets, will uh, increase the uh, 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 competition in the markets, and will provide a very strong immunization, if I may say so, to gas importing countries to uh, find the best uh, trade options for them. But to expect that we will have one global gas price is, I think, not something that we will see uh, uh, sometime uh, soon. So let me finish my uh, words. <coughs> and try to put my words, uh, thoughts together. First of all, China, then followed by India, they will be dominating the global energy demand growth and the, the oil trade will slowly but surely is going to move the uh, Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific uh, base. Technology is opening new, new fields, new oil resources, bringing new oil to the markets. This is a very good news. What we see in the United States, hopefully we will see in other countries as well in the context of shale oil and, and, and others. But it is very important to understand and uh, uh, make the others understand that the Middle East is and will remain 
crucial for the global oil markets for many years to come. We think the, the price gaps, especially for natural gas and uh, electricity prices, will remain. They may narrow down a bit if the right policies are put, uh, uh, pushed forward, but they will remain significant, uh, providing a very fertile ground for the competitiveness issues especially when it comes to the uh, energy intensive industries. And the improving energy efficiency here will be very good for everybody to bring the cost of energy down. Finally, I have to mention that the reducing the carbon footprint of energy is very important. Gas replacing coal is a very good example. Nuclear power should be, I believe, a part of the uh, energy equation again, and other, ener other energy sources such as the renewable energies, those who make economic sense, and in the longer term, carbon capture and storage, a critical technology, should be definitely considered and be part of the low carbon efforts what we have uh, today uh, altogether. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. So if you would, uh, make your way to the mic. Um, if you have a question for Dr. Burrell. Thank you very much for coming to Houston, Doctor. Um, I'm interested in the challenges of long-term forecasting and the impact of surprises and unknowns. You talked about uh, the nuclear situation with Fukushima. You talked about the shale revolution here in the U.S. So my question is, both looking back, say, at what the energy outlook told us in 1990, it may, not be, it may be very different from where we stand today. In your long career, what most surprised you other than the two examples I just gave? And if you had a crystal ball, what do you see uh, going forward as a, real, as a real surprise that could change what we've seen. One by one, or? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> of course, we couldn't forecast the Fukushima accident, definitely. Uh, and these accidents are um, tragic accidents, and they are not in the helm of the economy or energy. This can come in a moment. But uh, I can tell you, perhaps, uh, give. A, a few examples that we were successful and, and uh, one or two we were not successful. In 2008, colleagues from uh, Shell would remember, we made a big uh, effort for analyzing the oil fields. We made a field-by-field -field analysis, about 800 fields, looking at the decline rates and all the oil markets, and we wanted to, we came with a, a result that the oil prices need to be about $100 for many years to come in order to balance out the markets. But we finished the study, and I, would, I was about to go to the press conference, and uh, Peter is smiling because he knows the story. Oil prices at that time went down to $30. So you go in front of the press, and you are ready to say that the era of it was my one-liner, era of cheap oil is over, but it was $30, the oil prices. <laughs> so I had to make a, a decision, uh, enjoying some, uh, after enjoying some uh, very nice uh, French wine. So uh, what the decision was, let's tell the truth. We told the truth, and we said this one-liner, the era of cheap oil is over, and the uh, $100 is the price that we need to uh, see uh, in order to balance out the markets, and there are many variables here. The Middle East countries' uh, budget situation to the, uh, the cost of, capital, uh, cost of uh, uh, oil production is increasing and complexity of the fields, etc. So this, we were right there. One more thing, uh, we have many right things, but i give one more uh, example, and uh, I will stop there. Uh, in the year 2007, we said, you are not, nobody's from coal, perhaps, but coal is a very important uh, uh, 
energy uh, source as well. 2007, we said very soon, China will be a coal importer. At that time, it was it would be impossible to believe that the China would be a coal importer. And China is today a very large coal importer. So we were able to see that. So these two things uh, we saw. What didn't we see? <clears throat> I think we were very good in terms of seeing the shale gas revolution. Because 2009, we already before anybody else, we told it, but we were rather under, we underestimated the shale oil revolution. We knew it was coming, but the numbers we are seeing now is definitely higher than uh, uh, we thought, and uh, therefore uh, we revised them up. Uh, definitely, this is one area that we didn't uh, uh, see. Looking at the future, to be honest with you, I do not see on the any major new technology changing the game. But I can say that what I wish to see a technology change the game, which is the carbon capture and storage. If this technology becomes mature and economically and technologically accepted, we have huge fossil fuel reserves, which could be very good uh, and low cost without having any, any, any environmental implication and it will be very good for the wealth of the, increasing the wealth of the uh, uh, global economy. So I think this is something that I would like to see. But I wouldn't, I don't see in the next 20 years a major technological uh, 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 breakthrough. How much potential do you think there is for Europe and Asia to reduce their demand for natural gas and thus reduce the price for natural gas there by any of three ways? Uh, by investing more in energy efficiency, investing more in renewables, or by putting a tax on carbon that would spur the relative uh, favorability of renewables and efficiency? Now, uh, you are right. It is what they are trying uh, uh, to do, in fact. In uh, Europe, uh, renewables are enjoying a significant amount of subsidies uh, already. And if they were to put a price on carbon uh, today, the fuel which will lose a market share will not be gas, it will be coal. Now, I said there are many implications of the uh, shale gas revolution uh, in the United States. One of the implications is, in the United States, since the shale gas penetrated the market, a lot of coal, which is used in the United States, became available and it was exported to uh, Europe. A lot of coal came to Europe and the European coal prices crashed down and we are seeing in Europe a substantial amount of coal consumption growth now. In the most environmentally benign or, uh, countries like Germany and UK, we see in the last two years coal consumption growth, which, which are the highest in the last two years, is after the Second World War because it is cheaper. So therefore, if there was a carbon price, it will definitely uh, bring the coal down and the gas a bit up. But I do not expect, in any case, the share of gas to go down substantially in uh, Europe. Currently, the, uh, the uh, gas consumption in Europe uh, today is uh, much lower than pre-financial crisis uh, uh, levels. And therefore, I uh, see no major options. The only option I see in Japan, Japan going back to nuclear power uh, gradually and decreasing the share of gas in their uh, energy uh, mix. Otherwise, I think uh, gas will be a very strong part of the, both European and the Asian energy demand. But what about greater investments in efficiency as a way to bring down uh, electricity and gas use? The, in, there's a lot of effort and in the investment in energy efficiency. In fact, not only the, the efforts, there are some regulations to improve the energy efficiency. This will improve the, uh, uh, or reduce the electricity demand growth and therefore the gas and coal uh, uh, consumption. But the level will not be at a, a level that it will change the whole competitiveness issue. It will help but it will not change the big dynamics. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes, um, I'm, I'm curious what, <clears throat> pardon me, what kind of studies you may have done on the sustainability of the production. And the reason I ask that question is the large amount of drilling required to sustain the production. And while we realize, especially in the shale, that technology has improved uh, and completion techniques have lowered the cost, still the amount of drilling required to sustain and grow that production is substantial. And I'm just curious what kind of studies you may have done in that area. Mm. Uh, both uh, for, of course, uh, both for uh, gas and oil in terms of shale, uh, we see much steep uh, decline uh, rates. And therefore, it is like a it is like a bicycle. You have to turn the pedal all the time in order not to fall down. You have to inject money, and uh, uh, as long as the prices uh, in terms of oil about eighty dollar and uh, above, and in terms of the natural gas, perhaps around twenty twenty is between uh, five and uh, six dollar MBTU. I do not see a major economic uh, problem facing that. We will see production uh, to grow based on our study. We have time for one more question, so. Oh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Burrell, uh, thank you again for, for your discussion. You, you, you left us with two very opposing trends that uh, I find hard to come to grips with. One is the consensus on climate change, and the other is the growth in fossil fuel uh, uh, lead emissions to CO2. Yeah. So how, how do you see those two forces balancing each other going forward? And what, uh, the way I, I see it, the, the, there's a consumption and, and consumers need the energy. Uh, the fossil industry is produced to provide that. Uh, so, so it seems that policy is the, where, where the answer needs to come from. What, what, what policy changes and suggestions do you have to get that in balance? I think the, first of all, there is one technology which combines both of them, uh, reaching the uh, climate targets, but at the same time uh, using fossil fuels at acceptable uh, prices, which is the carbon capture and storage. I wish we would see carbon capture and storage uh, could penetrate the markets, but I have to be realistic. I do not see under the, in the current conjecture where we are, I don't see this is happening very soon unless there are uh, uh, significant government and industry push. What could happen is that if there is an international agreement on climate change in Paris, we may well see some regulations put together by the uh, governments and we may well see some uh, CO2 targets put forward by the governments, and each government can uh, reach a target as they want. In the United States, current carbon dioxide emissions of the United States is at the level of uh, early 1990s. How it happened? It happened for two reasons. One is the efficiency improvements. Second, perhaps more importantly, gas replacing coal. But we have to be here careful. Gas replaced coal and made a major achievement in terms of CO2 reductions, which is a very good news. But this is why Americans use a lot of gas. It is not because Americans love uh, environment more than Europeans. I don't think so. I, uh, why Americans use a lot of gas, not because it is new, let's use the shale gas, no. It is because it's domestic, no. There is one reason, because it's cheaper. If the gas prices go, according to our analysis, go above 550 and stay there for a long time, if there is no regulation, we may well see coal to make a comeback. So this is not taken for granted, by the way, this success of the United States. Therefore, what I suggest is we need both market instruments to reduce the, uh, uh, to address the climate change issue, but at the same time, 
it, it may well be needed that we need some regulatory measures in order to make sure that the, uh, the uh, low uh, uh, carbon energy sources are uh, used. And uh, if there is an agreement in 2015, next year, international agreement, I think most of the countries will use both of these instruments, market instruments, and when needed, some regulatory uh, instruments. Thank you. Thank you. I invite everybody to join us out front for